Good morning, Sozo family. Uh, Pastor Tom here. Uh, we're going to be continuing this morning in our series on the Beatitudes, but uh, before we do that, uh, I, I hope you're having an amazing Sunday. I hope you're with the ones you love, um, enjoying uh, this beautiful weather. Uh, I, I do encourage you, if uh, you're wa- as you're watching online, to uh, go ahead and, and go to the website and fill out the connection card there. Let us know that you're watching, or maybe you're watching on YouTube. Just make a comment, just wh- where, wherever you're watching from. We've got people watching from all over the place. Uh, go ahead and like and share. Um, if you're on Facebook, share uh, so that we can reach. Uh, this message reaches as much uh, people as possible. I'm also excited. Uh, maybe your kids are uh, doing schooling from home. Uh, my sc- kids are uh, doing the Sozo Learning Center, but they started school this week. I'm so excited. I'm excited to get back to some kind of routine um, that involves me having some time to work by myself. So anyways, uh, we're in a, uh, an amazing um, series right now. Uh, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and, and turn uh, to Matthew chapter 5. Uh, I'm going to read a verse out of chapter 4 before uh, 5, but uh, we're going to spend most of our time in chapter 5, Matthew chapter 5. Well, I want to pray before um, we get started, so would you pray with me? Uh, Father God, we we love you and we thank you so much for your word. Um, It is a a light unto our feet, and so we ask that you would guide us this morning by your word, that it would be um, rhema, that you would, you would bring it alive to us, that you would speak life to us this morning. We ask that you would um, give us your heart, that we would uh, be one in heart with you, one in spirit with you. Uh, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, I think that uh, this morning I'm excited to, to speak to you on this topic that we're going to speak about, but uh, I, I'm, I'm kind of a reflective person. I, I really... Uh, there's some things I do that I don't even realize I do that are very um, intentionally uh, influential uh, in my life. I, uh, I want to share one of them with you, and it's going to help kind of set up the message this morning. One of the things that I, I do on a regular basis, I don't even realize I do it, is I'm very aware how uh, short this life is. And I ponder it from time to time uh, that this life that I'm living right now, how it is, America, the governing authorities, missions, the church, all those things, um, this isn't how it's going to be forever. In fact, the the way I'm going to live uh, in the fullness of the kingdom of God after the return of Christ, that part of my life is going to exist uh, much longer than this part of my life. I might live, uh, I don't know, 100, 120 years, uh, maybe. if, 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 you know, if I'm really, if I live a really long time, but in the kingdom to come, that's going to be, you know, God in the scriptures calls it like a, a vapor. It's here and then it's gone. It's, it's really, really quick. And, and I say that to, to kind of give us some perspective of why, how important the message we're going to speak on this morning is, is that the, the Beatitudes is how the Sermon on the Mount starts. And the Sermon on the Mount really is, um, the, 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 the way the kingdom is supposed to be. It's the uh, constitution, some have called the, this the constitution of the kingdom. Um, how we are to enter the kingdom and how we are to live in the kingdom. And that's important because the kingdom we're talking about is the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. And that's the place I'm going to spend the majority of my existence. I'm in it now. The Bible says the kingdom's now and not yet, but how we view on a day-to-day basis, if we don't have the right perspective, the way we relate or the way we will act will be according to our perspective. So if our perspective lifts to something else, then we're going to be relating to our day based on a different perspective than the main perspective. Jesus says this, he says, beware of, and he's We've, we've talked about it recently, the leaven of the, of the Pharisees, the leaven of, of Herod, and then he talks about the leaven of the kingdom. In a sense, the, the perspective or the culture of, of the political system, beware of it because it will affect you and it's not the way I want you to live. Beware of the perspective and the culture of religion because I don't want you to live that way. And really this Sermon on the Mount and the Beatitudes is really, he's going beware of in a good way and allow this to become your norm. 
of, of who you really were made to be and how you're really supposed to carry yourself, how you're to relate with God, how you're to relate um, and view yourself, how you're to relate and view others and move towards them and treat them. And so this is extremely important. This is Sermon on the Mount. It's like how you're supposed to live forever. And I've, uh, I'm a football coach. I've uh, played football and coached footballs in different, uh, different seasons of my life. And one of the things I found is, is I, I played for some really amazing teams and coached some great teams. And then I, play, I coached different teams, and I, and I remember the transition of going from one of all I knew was maybe in a, a system of one way of thinking and then moved to another one. And I remember feeling the difference when I went to a different one, and I, I'm going, the way we treat practice, pregame, even the game, was completely different. And one system, all it, it was like all they did was win. They were just powerhouse, and they won on a regular basis. And then this other system, it was like it was good just to, to not lose more games than you won. It wasn't about having an undefeated season. It wasn't, it wasn't any of that. It was just really let's not get beat too bad, and if we do that, we'll be good. And I, and I was like, well, I was just very introspective, very um, watching, kind of going, what's the difference? And one of the things I watched was the difference in how we tr they treated practice and pregame and the game. And how we tr they treated the practice and the pregame really determined how well the game went. One treated it like as if it was the same. The intensity, the energy, the excitement for practice and pregame was, was near the same as the game. And it made that like everything was very natural when it came to the game. Then this other group, it was like the practice was kind of like, oh, let's not practice too hard lest we get injured. The, the, the truth was is that team had more injuries than the other team. And in fact, it took to like the third quarter before they actually started going and could move at the speed of the game. And so by that time, it was too late to, to, to catch up. The other team had, had already racked up um, so much on the, on the scoreboard there. They started catching up, but they couldn't ke catch up enough, and they would just lose on a regular basis. And I see that as believers sometimes we treat um, our lives, our day-to-day -day lives, differently than how we should. We kind of just go through it, and maybe Sundays we're like, yeah, we're believers, and... And this is the time we kind of, maybe we dress up and we're like, okay, we watch our language and we're kind to people and we got smiles. But when we leave and it's like, okay, game's over. And oh, this is just practice. And you know, this is, you know, and we, we, we kind of make this divide. And what I see is, is it's kind of like that team who lost on a regular basis. Your life is being like, you're getting beat up and, and things are difficult. And you're going to like, how come God isn't, you know, how he is on Sunday, how joyful and how, how wonderful things feel. I don't feel like that on Wednesday. And I really, I hope, I hope you catch what I'm saying, is the Sermon on the Mount is like how we should act at all the time. Not on Sundays, but every moment of every day. This is who, who we're supposed to be. And if we will allow this to become our new normal, if we allow this to become the culture become the, the, the ethics, become the, the way that we, we, we live our lives on a regular basis, really what's going to happen is we're going to fulfill Jesus' prayer where he says, May it be on earth as it is in heaven. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Um, Jesus said to his disciples and to those asking the question, how will we know when the kingdom come? Will it come from here or there? And he says, the kingdom is within you. That's where it starts. And this is really the, the, the way the kingdom starts is how we, 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 we allow it to affect us inwardly and it begins to affect everything because of how it works outwardly. And so uh, I, I encourage you to read the Sermon uh, on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount, for some of you, you've been believers a long time and you're out oh, Sermon on the Mount. Yeah, we know Matthew chapter 5 through 7. and blah, blah, blah. Some of you are new believers and you're like, Sermon on the Mount, what? Uh, it, the Sermon on the Mount is kind of like Jesus launching his ministry, and it's kind of his platform for his ministry or for the kingdom that he's, he's proclaiming has come. Really, it starts in, in um, I, I, I think it's best to, to view um, the starting of it. Yes, Matthew chapter 5, this is the start of it. 
but it's kind of like he makes a statement in chapter 4 that chapter 5 through 7 is saying, here's what that statement looks like played out, okay? And this is the statement. Matthew chapter 4, uh, verse 17. Jesus goes about and he begins to preach. And this is his first public ministry, he begins to preach. And he says this, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. All of Israel is waiting for um, the kingdom of God to arrive, or the kingdom of heaven to come. And Jesus says, it's at hand, it's, it's arrived. And many, many would say the kingdom is now and not yet. It has arrived, and in the fullness of it, of, in a sense, the inauguration of Jesus taking his position over all things is coming, but he's actually established it now. And so he says to repent. The biggest statement there I want you to catch is repent because something has come. The kingdom has come. God is, God is arriving, so get ready for his arrival, okay? So repent, the word to repent is to change, to change your mind, change how you live, change, change your ethics, change, change your culture, change, and get in line with what God says is, is, is his ethics and his culture and his ways. And so the Sermon on the Mount, starting with the Beatitudes, is really how, what God thinks it should be like. And he says to change from how you've been doing it to this. So the Sermon on the Mount is kind of like, this is what repentance looks like. Here's what you should change to, okay? That's super important. If this life that you're living right now is, is, is really pregame or practice and preparation for what's to come, then this is the playbook. You should really have this in your heart. This is... This is this is what God's looking down and actually giving the Spirit of God to conform us into. That we would act and move and God's saying, this is how I am. And here's how I want to make my kids. And so I believe that the Beatitudes is kind of, we got to view it two ways. Because it's really how, how Jesus, the Beatitudes is kind of how Jesus um, conducted himself and how he carried himself and who he was. Uh, it says there's a blessing um, and the result of because we acted like this, here's the reward of that. But, but I, I want to, I, I really believe there's the how we enter, but then also how we live. Because Jesus never had to repent when he says to us, repent. So there is a part of entering, of changing this direction to this direction. Jesus just got to live in that way on a regular basis. He didn't have to change how he was living just because he always lived that way. But he's inviting us to examine his life so we can live the way he lives. And he's like, let me just, in a sermon, give you how it should be. Moses goes up on a mountain and he gives the law. And Jesus, being like a Moses, goes up on a mountain. That's why we call it the Sermon on the Mount. He sits up, he climbs up a mountain, sits down, his followers gather, like Moses up on a mountain, gathering the law from God. They're gathering the law from Jesus. He's a Moses type, he's saying, and greater than. And it's actually broke up into five teachings. Uh, and, and so um, um, we have that same, very, very reflective to, to the, the, um, the book of Matthew is broken up in that way to, to kind of mirror Moses' five books of the, the law. So I want to take a moment and I want to show you now uh, the verse that we're going to be on. And I'm going to look at it to how we're supposed to, what we're supposed to catch out of the Beatitudes. So the first part of the, 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 first part of the verse there in the, in the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount is verse 3 in chapter 5. I want you to see what he says. He says that... So there in verse 3, he says, he starts with these blessings. He says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It's funny, if you, you look at the Sermon on the Mount um, and the Beatitudes specifically, it starts with that statement and it's repetitive. It ends, the Sermon on the, the, the Beatitudes ends with that same statement, and theirs is the kingdom. So it starts with that, blessed are those who are poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom. And then it ends and it says, blessed are those, and then he says, for those, theirs is the kingdom. And so it's kind of like this, this wrapping it up as the blessings. So 
we're blessed when we're poor in spirit. And, and, and Pastor Gary did an amazing job. If you missed that um, message, you can watch last week's message on our YouTube and on our Facebook. But really the idea is, is that no one's saying that being poor in spirit is good in the sense of like, that's something to, to uh, long after. I want to be I want to be poor in spirit. I want to really, you know, not, I want to be spiritually um, immature. He's not saying that. Um, to enter the kingdom in a way of the kingdom is that we're always um, in recognition of our need for God who's rich in spirit. That in separation from God, we're, in, we're, in, we're poor. God is rich and we're poor, so we're in desperate need for him. And so a way of the kingdom is, is, is to always, on a regular basis, be aware of our desperate need for God. Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Apart from me, you could do no good work, right? No, you could bear no fruit. We need him. Okay, the, uh, John 6, 63 says, the Holy Spirit produces uh, uh, eternal life. Human effort is useless. That we need God. We're in a desperate need. And so we want to always be aware of our need of Him. So in a sense, we're aware of our poverty and desperate need for God. Okay, and, and the fact is, is the more we get of Him, the more we realize we can have of Him and, and, and that we need. There's even more. Uh, there's a book from Randy Clark called There Is More. And uh, that's the discovery all of us are on is this huge, vast God and how much He really wants to share with us. And there is really more. And so there's always, we're always in this position of going, oh my gosh, Jesus, I need you. Father, I need you. Without you, I'm nothing. There's no life apart from you. I, I got to have you, okay? So that's that, that, that idea of being poor in spirit. Jesus says the Son does nothing apart from the Father, okay? So the second one, that the one I want to spend our, our time on, we're going to keep um, looking at the other ones in the weeks to come, but we have to capture this. This is so important. Verse 4, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall, be they shall be comforted. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Now, this, this, this is kind of a misunderstood. I, I, I hear it many, many different ways. And, and to be honest, it can be taken many ways. God, God is, is uh, I, I like to call him, kaleidoscopic. You ever look through a kaleidoscope? It's crazy what, what, what um, you can see and then try to find the same, same um, picture through a kaleidoscope and it's, it's nearly impossible. The, the, the continual beauty and changing is, is amazing. And I've discovered that in my walk with God is that he's kaleidoscopic. It, 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 he is holy. That's a constant. But my recognition of the, the continual layeredness and, uh, and the vastness of his, his holiness, that is, is continually changingly amazing. Okay? So I'm amazed on a regular basis by his beauty. And so um, this, this, this verse can be taken in, in, in several different ways and it has many layers. But I want to, I, like I said, there's a way that we, this is the way that we, the way I enter, the, I can't come into the kingdom without an awareness, in that verse 3, an awareness of my need for God. That Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. None come to the Father but by me. That there is, I am in need of the Father, and the only way to Him is through Jesus. So I am in desperate need. I am poor in spirit. I need you, God. So it's the way we enter the kingdom, but it's also that continual way that we stay in the kingdom. We don't become too proud and too... It says that John the Baptist came and he preached. He says, um, I, I'm one in the wilderness saying, make straight, right? Uh, the verse that he's, he's quoting, he's, he talks about making valleys, low places, high, up, flat, to make a straight way for the coming of the Lord. Jesus doesn't walk on crooked paths. He, he's a highway of holiness, okay? And so John is making straight his path. The things that are low come up. And the things that are high come down. If we're proud, he brings us low. If we have a very low too low in the sense, oh, I'm just a, and I'm just a piece of garbage, and why would God ever love me, and I just, I'm too far from, grace brings us up. And he says, yeah, but by the grace of God. Okay, so he'll bring us up to make things straight, level, place for the Lord to walk. And so um, 
the, 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 this is, is, is um, something that we have to capture. He says, when we mourn. First, I believe it's a way that we enter the kingdom, but I also believe it's a continual way that we stay in the kingdom. Going back to that, that I think that's all the Beatitudes. So this is, God, I have to, we have to ask the questions, what does God mourn at? I want, you, I want us to, this is, this is not, what do we mourn at? No, 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 no. There's always a, a that's a, the higher question, the, big, the better question is, what makes God mourn? And I'm going to look at some verses that we see in the scriptures, many places in the scriptures that we see um, God ha- takes compassion or he weeps, or we're, we're going to see what moves his heart. Um, but what moves his heart should move our heart. And here's what I want to say, is one of the things that grieves God is sin. Why? Because it separates us from God. God is holy. And so he's, he's, he's not mixing with unholiness. So we enter the kingdom through Jesus Christ, his atoning work on the cross, basically, let's say his blood, that makes us white as snow. It's an imagery of holiness. So he has, he has, ma- he has, he has, he has made us holy. And so now we can commune with a holy God. So the blood is holy. As we pass through the blood, as Israel did uh, in, 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 the, in the Passover story, the, 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 the blood makes us holy. We can commune now with a holy God. So we enter in in a certain way. And, and one of the things that we get to over time develop is this connection and this communion with God. And here's, here's, here's what it is. The Bible says that God wants to relate to us as father but also as bridegroom as our husband. And, and Jesus says, I no longer call you servants or slaves, but I call you friend because I've revealed the plans. So this is an imagery of friendship as a father, but also as a bride, is that if you spend enough time with him, he'll share his heart with you. And the idea is, is that I want to spend enough time with God that I would understand what makes him mourn. What makes God mourn? If I, if I understand that, that, the, that God made this earth for something, and partly what makes him mourn is that it's actually not, not actually being related to and with and being lived out the way he created it to be. Now, I know the potential of my children, and when they act a certain way, it grieves me because I know, I know what, they could, what they could be. I know, I know what they were really made for. God's, God, part of what Jesus mourns at and what the Father mourns at is he knows what, what, where, where we're heading and what we're made for. Okay? So if I capture that, that God actually mourns over me when I'm, when I'm off in sin because he knows I'm, he made me for more than that. He made me for life and joy and peace. And those sin, it steals all of those things from me. It leads to death. And he's like, oh, I made you for life, not death. And so, if I, if, I, if, I, if I capture my father's heart and, and I capture what really moves his heart, what mourns him, it would mourn me. I've in, I'm in uh, been married for 13 years, and with my wife, I want to, I, because I, I love her and I'm close enough, I know, I know what makes her um, excited or joyful or, or happy, and I know what mourns her. And so the Bible says in Hebrews, uh, or Romans, actually. Um, Romans chapter 12, verse 15, he says, Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. And I'm just like, first and foremost, God. What does God rejoice over? <laughs> I'm his child. I want to I wanna, I wanna mirror him. I'm his bride, and I want to be equally yoked. I want to be, be like him. And so what, what does he rejoice at? I want to rejoice at that. What makes him weep? I want to weep at that. Okay, I want to capture his heart, and I want to become one with him. That was Jesus' prayer in John 17. May we be one. As Father, he says, Father, as we're one, may we be one. And may they be one with us. And so if we're one, I'll, have it, I'll possess his heart. And when he rejoices, when love wins, he rejoices. When there's injustice, he weeps. When things are less than he made them to be, his heart mourns. But when we respond to bring the kingdom into play, into that place, and bring it up, he rejoices. 
So we want to possess his heart. He says, you're blessed when you capture your father's heart and you mourn at what he mourns at. He's all you'll be comforted. And so the, to repent, to come into the kingdom is to recognize my desperate need, my poverty, but also uh, I think about Jonah and Nineveh. Jonah gives a message about a current um, coming of judgment and they repent and they show it with mourning. Sackcloth and act, they mourn. And God sees their hearts that have truly changed. They recognize how they've grieved God by mourning over it. And God responds by not bringing the judgment he was going to. He relents, he gives mercy. And so this is an imagery I believe of how we come in. We recognize our desperate need and we call upon God. And even in our hearts, we grieve at the fact of, of, of what we've done towards God by our actions and towards others and our hearts grieve. And God, in a sense, he relents and he blesses and he comforts. He says, oh, son, it's okay, come. So I think it's, it's how we enter the kingdom, but also now, now I'm not on a regular basis thinking about my sin, but the Holy Spirit made me aware of, my, of what my sin does and so I mourn because I've gained the spirit gave me the heart of the father to understand what it really is and what it's worth and what it's done so I, 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 I weep I, I, I mourn at my actions and I change them but now in the kingdom I'm not on a constant awareness of sin because I've turned away from it so now my awareness is what father what, what what's on your heart Sometimes it's good, but sometimes it's not. He's like, look at that injustice. I remember going to Burkina Faso for the first time and seeing poverty, seeing uh, a community who had a well, but a part had broken. And for, for years, the, all, everything except a part that cost less than $100 was there. So they walked miles to get dirty water. They were drinking dirty water. Fresh water was $70 away. <laughs> in a sense, for the whole village to have water on a regular basis. It was $70 for one part. And they said, we've been raising and saving money for the last two years, and we think in the next year we can do it. And I was like, I, I'm pretty sure I got $70. I was only like 21 years old, and I'm like, I, I can spare $70. But a whole community couldn't. And that grieved me. I mourned at that. And then I responded. And so I think that that's when I, 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 the, a picture of, of, of just one moment in my life, and I know you've had those moments as well, if we were to, to see someone um, batter a child for no, just batter a six-year-old child, let's say, your heart would move, you would be mourned. You, no, this is not right. When we see photos of, 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 of disasters, um, when we see children and women and, and men who have, 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 have gone through something, their homes have been ripped apart or burned down and maybe the fires in California, whatever it is, and our hearts are moved and go, that's, that's terrible. Why? Because that's God's heart. God's going, that's terrible. When someone's in sin, um, whether it's sexual sin, I know I, I, have, I, have, I have friends that are believers who who tell me that they have friends that are, are uh, I have um, uh, one event that, that when Donald Trump got elected um, four years ago, and on the day after his election, uh, a friend of mine who's a believer was sad. And they were sad because they were worried for their um, homosexual friends. And they, they were worried for their, the, 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 how they were feeling. And I'm like, listen, you're mourning, but not what God's mourning. See, we, can, we, we have the things we mourn over, but, the, but are they the things that God mourns over? God's not mourning over their worriedness about Donald Trump. He's, he's mourning over the fact that they're living in a, in a constant state of sin that shall lead to death and separate them from a good, loving God forever. He mourns at that. So this person thinks they're doing good by mourning with their, their homosexual friends who are on a destination for death and hell forever. I'm like, that grieves me that you're grieving over that. What you need to grieve over is their current separation from a loving God. That's what you need to grieve over. 
And we have a solution. It's the gospel. Do we grieve over the fact that thousands of babies are aborted on a regular basis? Do we grieve at the fact that there is genocide around the earth? Do we grieve at the things that God grieves at? Do we grieve at the fact that there's billions of people who never heard the gospel, who don't know the true, genuine love of, of, of God who's been displayed upon the cross? It's not been shared with them. Do we grieve? Do we mourn? And are we moved to action by the Spirit of God who has shown us the Father's heart? Are we grieved? Or do we just go about our day? That's why I'm saying this is important that we have perspective. We just go about our day. We're just only concerned about our little sphere and how happy we are and what we're eating for dinner or this or that. And we don't, we haven't caught for a moment what's on God's heart. I I believe that Jesus is, he knows what this world was made for. And if we get close enough to him, spend enough time with him, he'll share his heart with us. And we'll begin to be moved to do the things that he calls us to because of, of, of what he knows he's made available to us as a solution to the poverty of this world. This, and when I say poverty, I mean less than what it was made to be. Oh, Jerusalem, Jer- Jerusalem. The, this, this, this cry of Jesus. Let's read it. It's in Matthew 23, verse 37. Jesus says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, he who killed the prophets and stoned those who are sent to her. How often I've wanted to gather your children together as in the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were unwilling. His heart, weeping over Jerusalem, he knows what he wants to do. He knows what he shall do one day and gathering under to deliver and to rescue. The, 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 the angel tells um, Mary and Joseph to name Jesus, Jesus, to name your child Jesus, for he will save his people from their sin. The name Jesus is, is Yeshua, which is Yahweh is salvation, or Yahweh saves. You will name him Yahweh saves because he will save his people from sin. He's like, I know what I was made for, and I know what you were made for. I have been made to rescue you and deliver you from your current state and to your glory. I've come to to reveal to you what you were made for. And he weeps because they won't won't allow him to. And in fact, they kill him. (laughs) And I think some of us have not been comforted because we're grieving, like my friend, over the wrong things. Then that's not the thing that, that grieves God. You're grieving over uh, what you think is injustice, and God goes, no, that's the wrong thing to grieve over. Some of you, because of, of, of religion, you don't think that you're allowed to feel. You're not allowed to hurt. You're not allowed to... So you just you lock up your heart, and you keep God at a distance. And the Scripture says He binds up broken hearts. He longs to comfort you. He's literally called the comforter. Some of you are parents and, and you did your best. You loved your children well and, and you weren't perfect, but you, you, you worked several jobs to put food on the table and to, to give them the desires of their hearts. And maybe, maybe at this point in, in, in the season you're in, your kids don't even want to talk to you. And your heart needs comforting. And there's a God in heaven who relates his heart mourns over that. He's got children as well that he loves dearly who don't want to talk to him. He can relate to you. It mourns, it grieves him, and he wants to comfort you today. But does your heart mourn and grieve at the fact that he's got millions and even billions of children who haven't, don't talk to him? Don't even know he's calling out for them. Maybe you, uh, your spouse has sinned against you in a grievous way, whether it's adultery or they've done something grievous, and your heart is hurting and you need comfort. There's a Father, there's a God in heaven who, who, who can relate. He literally says that Israel has committed adultery by giving themselves to 
I, I, idols to, to, to uh, something other than him. And he, he still longs for the ones who've done that to him to forgive and to draw near. He mourns with you. But do you mourn with his heart? I think about some of you have been betrayed. You're hurting and God wants to comfort. I think about Judas, who, who with the feet that he walked towards the betrayers of Jesus, the, 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 the ones who would, who would crucify him, he, his feet were just washed by Jesus. His feet are clean because Jesus stooped down and washed his feet. And with those same feet, he went to the ones that would kill Jesus. And Jesus, knowing this, still washes his feet. I have only found that, that everything that truly genuinely grieves me in the Spirit of God is because he can relate. <laughs> Scripture says that he's not a high priest unaware of our suffering. But I want my heart to mourn at the things that mourn his. And he says, when, when, we, when we get into that relationship, when we're one in that way, when my heart mourns at the things that mourn him, then his heart mourns at the things that mourn me because we're one in spirit. And he says, oh, you shall be comforted. I want to pray for you. I want to pray that God would come and comfort. But that today at the, the, the teaching of the word, the, the speaking, the reading of the word, that there might have been something, something in your life currently that grieves God, and you need to repent. You need to turn away from it. An action or behavior, or how you're treating others, or how you view him, or something you're allowing in your life that's stealing, and it grieves him. And he's saying, you're going to be blessed if you capture my heart and you change to, 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 to what I, I, I'm showing you is the right way. I'm not, he's not a thief. He's not trying to take. He's like, no, I give to abundance and overflowing. I've come to give life in it to the full. Now the enemy, he's the thief. And if you live that way, you will continue to be stolen from. But if you come under, let me bless you. I will comfort you. But have you spent enough time with God to get his heart? To view your sin the way he views it? Maybe someone else has sinned against you and you need to forgive them. It mourns God that he forgave us of all of our sins and we won't forgive someone other, someone else of theirs. We should mourn over the fact that God gave everything to forgive us and we won't even go a, a, a little bit in that direction to forgive someone else. You need, maybe you need to forgive someone or maybe you, right now you're aware of the fact that you have hurt someone else and you need to turn away from that and call them up. You need to capture the heart of God that the fact that the vision is not, does not please God. Hatred in your heart towards your brother does not please God. That you would mourn over the fact that you have acted unlike your God in heaven and you have allowed the bitterness and the hatred in your heart to cause your life to be separated from the ones that you should be connected to as family and friends. On earth as in heaven looks like us being, being, being connected in love with one another. So if there's people in your life that you're separated from, I, I wonder if you'd spend enough time today after I pray to get quiet and kind of ask God, is, there's, is there something grieving your heart in my life that I need to stop? I need to grieve over and change. Have you allowed your, your, your the, we, we, the church calls it kind of like sacred and, 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 and secular. Have you allowed your life to be sacred and secular? You go to church and it's sacred. Oh, we're very holy and all that on Sunday. But we go in on Tuesday or Wednesday, we're at the shipyard or we're on the golf course or we're bowling or we're in the car or we're, 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 we're um, a plumber or we're an architect or whatever. And in those other environments that we're surrounded by secular people, worldly people, and we allow ourselves 
to act like them. Instead of, as the Sermon on the Mount goes to say, Jesus, I'm the light of the world. And then he calls you the light of the world. Are you becoming the light of the world because you're beholding the one who is? He says, man, Hebrews 12, strip off the things that are tangle you. And, 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 and so we can run this race. And he says that you would behold Jesus. It's by looking upon him that we can let those things go and not have this sacred and secular. But we would, we would act in, in, in every moment of every day with the perspective of the importance of what we were made for. The Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes. It's the ways of the kingdom. So I want to pray for you. I want to pray that you would capture the Father's heart. I believe as I look at Matthew 25, Matthew 25, Jesus talks about, um, he says that uh, he comes and he blesses those he, he calls sheep. He says, for when I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. When I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. When I was a stranger, you invited me in. When I, was, when I needed clothes, you clothed me. When I was sick, you came. Uh, when I was in prison, you visited. And they said, when did we do this? He said, when you did it for the least of these. In a sense, these are people who caught the heart of God that he goes, that's not what I made. That's, they, they are made for more than that. And you caught my heart and you were moved and you responded. And when you did it for them, you were doing it for me. You were acting like me for them and towards them. And it's as if you were doing it for me. Will we be those people who are rewarded on that day because we possess the heart of the Father? What grieved him grieved us. And we are moved to action. So I'm going to pray for you. And just bow your head. Turn your hearts and your attention to the Lord. Father, we just invite you into every home, to every car, to wherever someone's listening to this message. We invite you right now. Come by the Spirit of God. And I ask by the Spirit of God you give us your heart. What's on your heart? Would you share your heart with us? If you're joyful right now, what, what, what are you rejoicing over? If you're grieved right now by something, what are you grieving over, Lord? Is there things in our lives that you grieve over? Things that we've allowed in our homes? Ways that we've been treating our parents? Ways we've been treating our, our kids, our brothers and our sisters, our friends, our coworkers, our bosses. The way we've talked about them behind their back. The way we've schemed. Is there something that we have done that is dishonoring, that, that, that grieves your heart? Lord, show us so that we, we can repent and that we can align ourselves with your heart and with the ways of your kingdom. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Here's my challenge to you. Take a moment, rest in that prayer for a moment, and respond correctively. And this is a daily thing. God, what's on your heart? And as you do that, I believe... Those things that are in your life that need comfort, oh, the comforter is going to come. And you can invite him to come. Sometimes we're more concerned about what's on our heart than what's on his. And when we begin to be concerned what's on his heart, there's a change of, of the invitation of the comforter to come and to comfort the things of ours. I bless you with that. So I just bless you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I ask that he would bless and keep you. He would guide you by his spirit, make his face shine upon you, and his peace fill your home and in your lives as you continue to align your life with the ways of the kingdom. God bless you guys. Hope you have an amazing week. If you are blessed by this video, please subscribe to our YouTube channel for more amazing content.